So uh, we start our uh, second talk. Uh, the speaker is uh, Kostya Drac from IST Austria, and he'll tell us about uh, black box mappings and the rigidity of uh, rational maps. Yeah, thank you, Kostya. Uh, it's actually a, a great honor to be here. Uh, in fact, bed level is sort of my uh, first love because uh, approximately 10 years ago, the first ever scientific conference I attended was here. So it's actually nice to be back. And every time I have some warm feelings coming back. But uh, well, sentiments aside, uh, today I want to talk to you about, well, black box mapping synergy of rational maps. I did first immoral thing of making a mistake in the title. Um, and maybe the second mistake in the title should be in fact, black box box mappings, because I want to convince you that uh, this concept of box mappings as a generalized normalization cost concept is very useful in attacking rigidity questions for rational maps. And uh, let me do a second immoral thing uh, by showing in the, as the first slide, this one, which is completely unreadable and uh, perhaps incomprehensible. Uh, but what I want to show you is the list of results that are uh, that can be analyzed using the machinery of uh, complex box mappings. Of course, it's historically inaccurate because the list of results shown here, um, some of them, the techniques that were developed uh, for them were um, um, are in the basis of uh, what I will be talking about. But um, it is nice that, well, everything that is listed here, uh, various type of rigidity results for polynomials and rational maps, they can be uh, understood and conceptual, conceptualized in, in the same way, using the, uh, this generalization uh, that we call complex box mapping. Of course, the, the classical renormalization is when we can extract a polynomial-like map. This is a classical notion due to the idea in Hubbard, and this is a branch covering between two disks. So one is compactly contained in the other, and uh, we have a straightening theorem which says that, well, if we can extract such an object, then we can straighten it to, to an actual polynomial, and therefore we can analyze um, kind of embedded uh, dynamical systems in kind of a larger dynamical systems. And uh, the map is called renormalizable uh, if, if we can extract a polynomial like map with connected Julia set and it is non renormalizable otherwise. Um, and of course, the question how can we construct more complicated embedded dynamical systems more than just uh, polynomial like maps? And the answer is to consider first return maps to a nice set. So Igor has already mentioned that renormalization is basically all about considering first return maps. And let me, uh, well, agree with Igor uh, and uh, show you how you can do that uh, in a bit more details. So what is a nice set? The nice set, uh, if I have a map F and I want, um, I call a set B nice, and this is a definition due to Marco Martens, if the forward orbit of the boundary uh, does not intersect the interior of a set. And if I have a nice set, then I, I have a well-defined first return map. And this picture is supposed to illustrate how it actually works. So suppose B is this set of four circles and uh, suppose the green point travels through some globally defined dynamical system and in uh, its third iterate lands in, in set B. Then uh, if I consider uh, the pre-image of, of uh, this uh, component small v under the third uh, iterate, then, um, well, potentially this picture can occur, but since b was nice, it in fact can't. Well, because if I consider a point, uh, red point here at the, at the boundary, then the, its forward orbit lands somewhere in the interior of my set b, which is not allowed for nice sets, and therefore, well, this is contradiction, such point cannot exist. And the, the right picture is like this. So the uh, pre-image of V is this set uh, small u. And we have, uh, and the third iterate of my uh, map F maps this small u to V. And we obtain a branch of first return map. 
And well, we can consider all possible branches of first return and well, land up in, in a picture like so. Observe that if the orbit of some point Z intersect B infinitely many times, then the first return map will um, be defined for infinitely many iterates of that, of, of this point Z. Therefore, uh, if I consider first return map, I essentially capture the orbit of, of that point Z. Um, moreover, if the critical set of my point of my map F is in B, then uh, the uh, the critical points um, well they will they will be also in the uh, in in the critical uh, points of this first return map. So if I enclose critical points and consider first return maps, uh, I sort of does not create do not create trouble. And of course, with some luck, we can arrange uh, so that the picture is true, so so that all these uh, green uh, well sets they are compactly contained. And in this way, we arrive to the uh, structure of a complex box mapping. And this is a formal definition. Uh, for me, complex box mapping is a holomorphic map uh, between two sets, curly U and curly V, in the uh, Riemann sphere, uh, such that uh, the, the map has finitely many critical points. Uh, the range is a union of finitely many Jordan disks. Then each branch of this map F is the uh, is a map from from component of u to component of v and this is a proper map and importantly uh, every component uh, uh, of v is either a component of u so they can coincide or components of curly u compactly contained in uh, the components of of uh, curly v so basically what i just said is the is the kind of spell out of this picture right and this is kind of a what you expect when you consider first return uh, in general. And the one of the objectives of this talk is just to tell you what we know about such an object. Uh, and of course, you can imagine that while well, this definition is fairly general, so we can expect some, some unusual phenomena, something that you would probably would not expect if you work with rational maps, for example. Uh, before going forward, let me define, well, this, this, that, that map defines the puzzle pieces, so I can pull back uh, the range several times and consider components of this nth pullback, and they, I call them puzzle pieces, and n measures the depth. Then uh, I can define the uh, field in Julia set, or field Julia set of my map as a set of points on which I can iterate my map infinitely many times. And uh, the important concept for this talk is a concept of fiber. If I take a point X, I can define a fiber of X as the intersection of all puzzle pieces containing this point X. So from the symbolic point of view, if my puzzle pieces represent kind of symbolic coding of points, then um, uh, the fiber of X is the set of points that has the same symbolic dynamics as the point X. And we say that the fiber is trivial, well, if the fiber of X is just a point X, and which means that the orbit of X can be distinguished combinatorially via the symbolic dynamics given by the uh, box mapping uh, from all other orbits. Excuse me, just a quick question. Uh, so in your definition, uh, it is, is it possible that uh, some of the points of the Julia sets will be on the boundary of U? Um, Uh, no, no. Well, yes, 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 it's possible. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, it, it, well, in, in general, it's possible. Yeah, yeah, I, I will. Yeah, I will, I will mention that, but uh, I, will, I will come to that uh, in, in a second. Okay, here's an example. Uh, well, uh, example that probably most of you have seen already. This is a, a Julia set of, uh, of uh, uh, this cubic polynomial that you can see on the slide. And uh, this polynomial has a property that one critical point is not escaping, this minus one is not escaping, and one is, escapes. And then um, if I take some, some equipotential line 
in the basin of infinity and take take this three image this this two uh, orange blobs I call them u1 and u2 and then if i take the union of u1 and u2 and consider the restriction to this union that gives me um, a box mapping well fairly trivial uh, box mapping and for example this this uh, black part here is the fiber of minus one Of course, uh, this is not, uh, well, we were not the first who, who gave this notion, and uh, uh, this notion has a lot, a lot of history behind it, uh, which I will not fully mention, but let me highlight kind of two aspects. Uh, in real interval dynamics, the notion of, of a box mapping was, uh, well, a similar construction first appears in the work of Jakobson, Guggenheim, and Johnson, who actually coined the term box map. Uh, and uh, Gracek Schwantek uh, in the early 80s, um, in the 80s, uh, early 90s. Uh, but their approach was uh, through the scheme, which was called inducing. They were basically trying to, uh, well, considering uh, fine and fine and refinement of branches of the map, as opposed to taking first returns. And in holomorphic dynamics, this idea of using this renormalization idea of saying, well, we can consider first return maps uh, uh, is, due, is due to Lubitsch, who suggested to uh, consider such um, first return maps uh, and who introduced this generalized polynomial like map concept in the early 90s. And well, after, afterwards, uh, there was sort of became classical, and uh, in the literature, you can find uh, several other. Uh, notions um, uh, similar to that called puzzle mappings, R mappings, uh, etc. Uh, in in my talk and in well in our work, uh, our box mappings are in fact generalized renormalizations in the sense of uh, Michel Lubitsch. So let me now go to this black box, uh, and this is the set of results which we can prove for uh, this general concept of, of a complex box map. And um, well, let me start with something that you can actually show in the uh, very beginning, just from the definition. Well, we call them pathologies, and this is uh, well four examples. So, first example of what we call a pathology. Uh, well, sorry, before going uh, forward, let me mention that this that this black box is our joint work with uh, Trevor Clark, uh, Alexis Lost, and Sebastian van Strin. So we uh, can construct the box mapping where the uh, field in Julia set is actually the whole uh, uh, the whole range. So the field in Julia set not necessarily, for example, closed. And and this is a trivial example you can see on the right. This is a perfectly viable box mapping, albeit quite boring. Then we can construct a box mapping F two such that uh, the field in Julia set has a full measure in in the domain, there's empty interior, and uh, there exists a positive measure set of points in this field in Julia set that do not accumulate at any critical point. And why it is sort of unexpected? Because usually when, when you avoid critical points, then you could expect some sort of expansion, and hence um, uh, the, you, can, you can run some sort of Lebesgue density point argument to show that this set will be of measure zero. And this is not the case. I will return to this example a little bit uh, later. Then we can construct a, uh, a box mapping with a wonder in this, uh, which tells us that if I consider puzzle pieces for my box mapping, they, they not necessarily shrink to points. Um, well, even in, in good cases. And finally, a more elaborate example is the box mapping F4 uh, for which um, the critical set uh, is in the field Julia set, and the set of points in the field Julia set uh, whose orbits converge to the boundary of uh, my uh, range as full measure. So why why it is important? Or why it is sort of unexpected? Because usually, when you ever have you ever seen puzzle pieces, for example, for polynomials, again I'll mention them a bit later, then the boundary of puzzle pieces is usually a repelling set. And hence, well, when you approach the boundary, you can be, kind of, you are repelled back. And again, you can use some sort of uh, contraction or backward um, 
uh, expansion to prove that this set that goes to the boundary is of measure zero. But well, this is not the case in general. And in fact, many of these phenomena uh, is related to the fact that the uh, range of my box map, uh, sorry, the domain of my box mapping is not necessarily uh, a finite collection of, of sets. So it can be infinite collection of sets that basically tile the range, for example. So I do not uh, say that this is impossible. Yes. Well, the so so it seems that four also has the property of two. So what happens to the points in two? Are you saying that they accumulate at some points in the interior of of the range? Um, well, the difference. First of all, the difference is here. Uh, well, the example that we construct in uh, in in two is simple. So for uh, you can you can um, get something without critical point, right? So imagine that you have just a disk and a bunch of disks inside that maps univalently on top. Well, uh, then uh, then kind of you cannot construct such an example as two. But if you kind of tile the the disk uh, with these sets without any critical points, then you can arrange that uh, um, the positive measure set, uh, well, will will stay with this box mapping. But, but, but I guess you'd expect those points, the orbits to go to the boundary of the domain of definition at least. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah, well, and the elaboration in point four is that you can do that even in the presence of critical points. So you can still have critical points in, in your field to the set um, uh, and still have this full measure. Right. So basically, this this tool is is saying that well, Schwarz lemma doesn't work in general because we have infinitely many components in the domain, and four you can elaborate a bit more. Right? Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. So then, well, this is this is pathologies, um, and uh, well, they were called pathologies because this is what you would not expect, well, if you work at least with rational maps. Another type of result that we can prove for general box mapping is a Manier type uh, theorem. The classical result of Manier for rational maps says that um, you, you have an expanding set uh, for, for points that do not uh, cross the accumulation set of some recurrent critical points, they're not parabolic, and uh, they're not in, in parabolic uh, basins. So. Uh, which more or less says if you avoid critical points, then you have uh, some sort of expansion um, along the orbit. And uh, in fact, we can prove something similar for the general concept, uh, general uh, concept of box mappings. Before stating the theorem, let me give a couple of definitions. So, and this definition actually related to the fact that I can renormalize box mappings many times. Well, how do I do that? Uh, I can define inductively the following set of complex box mappings. I take, well, my, my starting box mapping is uh, f from u to v. Uh, this is a starting zero step. And then for every next step, I take the union of the components in the domain in the previous step that contains a critical point. And in this picture here, you can see uh, some example of a box mapping, and then I take this components U1 and U2, which contains the critical points C1 and the C2 of my box mapping, and I take the union of the sets. Well, this, this union is actually a nice set, and you can check that this is true. Uh, and therefore, first return map that this union is, is well defined. And if I consider first return map, that will be a, a perfectly acceptable uh, box mapping. Uh, where each branch of this uh, new box mapping are just iterates of my old box mapping. And uh, I can proceed. In this way, I can construct this uh, sequence of f mu uh, from u nu to v nu. Right, so kind of in each step, the, the, the range of the map will be kind of finer and finer neighborhoods of critical points, and well, everything that returns to these neighborhoods. And we were able to prove this, this uh, type of result, which uh, is a bit of a mouthful, but let me uh, spell it for you. Uh, so one assumption that I want to make for, for my box mapping is that the, uh, it has some start in moduli bounds, which means that uh, for each um, pair of components U and V of 
uh, this curly u and curly v, um, either they coincide or there is some modulus between v and u. And this modulus is delta. Um, well, this is the condition that uh, uh, kind of weaker. So it's not, I, I don't require it at kind of at every level, but at the starting level, I have some modular bounds. For instance, this one is trivially satisfied if you have only finitely many components in U, right? Because, uh, well, uh, that will be just automatically by finiteness. Uh, well, if you have infinitely many components, they have to be, well, uh, shrinking if you, uh, as you approach to the, to the boundary. So what we can prove under this assumption that for, um, for every new, remember that new was controlling the, the depth uh, of a neighborhood of a critical set. And, uh, for, some, uh, and for each kappa, which I, um, there exists uh, an expansion rate lambda and some constant C such that for all uh, K and X in, in the domain of my box mapping, uh, if the first K minus one iterates of uh, K uh, iterates, K minus one iterates by the point, they are not in this neighborhood, new neighborhood of a, of a critical set. And the case iterate do not come close to the boundary of B. And the, the way uh, the, and if quantitatively we are not coming uh, closer than this uh, constant kappa, then for, uh, for the k iterate, I have uh, an expansion, uh, well, lambda k times the constant. Well, uh, what's, what, this, what this actually says. So if, if I take an orbit and this orbit avoids some neighborhood of a critical set and does it come close to the boundary, then it is part of the hyperbolic set. Um, just naive question. The, uh, the Manet theorem for rational function can, is it a particular case of this or uh, how it is related? Well, uh, for rational maps, if you can extract a box mapping, I guess you can, you can prove Manier. But the point is that Manier is about, well, any rational map, right? So it's kind of a fairly general result. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I do not know a general procedure how you can operate with locally defined map for general rational maps. Mm -hmm. So you can do that uh, uh, in the classes of rational maps that, uh, well, has box mappings when you can extract nice couples. So you can, well, do that in some cases, but uh, I don't know how to do it in general. Okay, thank you very much. But in this statement, let me um, mention one thing before going forward. We are not required that the, the orbit of X uh, is a void in the mega limit set of recurrent point, critical points. So this is uh, in some sense uh, closer to the real Manier theorem than uh, for a complex Manier theorem. As I mentioned, there was, there was a set of pathologies, something we were not expecting uh, when we started um, uh, working with complex box mappings. And of course, our motivation was coming from rational dynamics. We wanted to understand uh, rational maps. And kind of to avoid this, this uh, pathologies, we introduced the class of dynamically natural box mappings. And well, this is a set of uh, assumptions that um, you would expect if you work with rational maps. So the first assumption for dynamically natural box mapping is that every component of your domain contains escaping points. So the stupid example with the disk and identity on it is not uh, dynamically natural. Then the Lebesgue measure of points in the um, non-escaping set that do not accumulate at any critical fiber uh, is zero. So um, I want to avoid this, this uh, strange examples where I can hook up something uh, that contradicts, uh, um, well, contradicts my knee or, or, but, and you can, um, you can see, for example, comparing it to this Manier type result that I mentioned, that uh, basically that sort of prohibits you to be, it sort of controls what's going on in the boundary. Since we do not know what, what kind of big dynamical system gave us this box mapping, we have to assume something at the boundary. And finally, the, uh, uh, 
the non-escaping set for my box mapping should consist of points that from time to time uh, visit components of uh, U that are well inside. So from time to time, I go into the, um, uh, in the, in the uh, kind of well inside the interior of, uh, um, of P. And formally, that means that for uh, each point uh, in the non-escaping set, uh, I, I should be able to find some delta that depends on um, on this point X and infinitely many components UI of uh, NVI of U and V such that uh, the, well, there's a moduli bound between VI and UI and the orbit of X kind of jumps into this UI. Right, so this is just a subsequentially from time to time you, you jump into components that, that has some space between them and the boundary of P. You do allow in your box mappings to have domains, infinitely many domains, which accumulate at some interior points of V, right? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Okay, so this is actually, a, uh, well, from, from one side, uh, from first side, it, it might be a bit uh, uh, counterintuitive, but I hope I convinced you to at least uh, uh, some order of epsilon that this is something that you would uh, hope for, for uh, rational maps. But let's see what we can prove with this notion. Uh, we call a map F box renormalizable, at least for the purpose of the SOC, uh, if there, is a, there exists a nice union of um, uh, because it's nice union V of topological disks uh, such that the first return map to this, un uh, this V uh, under F is the dynamically natural box mapping. And we uh, assume that the critical set of this box mapping capital F uh, is a subset of my starting critical set. Well, so what is this definition? So we first assume that, well, the box mapping is dynamically natural, and there's an additional assumption that the critical set of F, capital F is in grid, uh, small f, and why it, is so, why it is sort of needed, because if you are not careful enough, if you take a, a well, small neighborhoods of, of critical points, then it might be that the first return map uh, will accumulate infinitely many critical points. And this is kind of a schematic picture of how, how that can happen. So if, if, the, if uh, this green disk is where I want to consider first return, and uh, what might happen is that uh, all these smaller components, they travel through some one component of my starting map uh, and return back. So at each of the smaller components, I, I acquire a critical point. And well, I can, do, uh, I can get it infinitely many of those. So you have to, assume. But usually, uh, and as we discussed earlier, uh, usually what you do, you start with, a, with some map, you take a neighborhoods of a critical set, and if you consider first return to that neighborhood, this condition is automatically satisfied. Well, a couple of remarks. A box renormalizable uh, map may or may not be renormalizable in the classical sense of Duandi and Hubbard. And uh, if you have a recurrent critical point, then the box mapping um, uh, is infinitely many times uh, box normalized. And this actually follows the idea of, of, of Misha, uh, which, which basically suggested uh, back in the 90s that uh, even if you are not renormalizable in the Doherty Hubbard sense, you can still renormalize in some generalized sense. And this is a, what, we, what we are doing. And you can, in fact, do it infinitely many times. Uh, and as I mentioned to the answer to Gennady, uh, if we start with some globally defined F, it's not clear whether we can extract a box mapping uh, or box to normalize our starting map F. But what I want to uh, convey to you that if you can, then you are in good shape. Then you can use this black box that I'm, I'm, I'm discussing and you can use the result from that black box to conclude something about your starting map F. So and what we can do, uh, what we can prove about rigidity. Um, well, first we, we can establish this dynamical rigidity result. And this is a joint uh, result with Duke Schleicher 
and it's in a generalization of result by uh, uh, Alec and uh, Sebastian, uh, which says the following. So if I start with a dynamically natural box mapping F, capital F, and I pick an arbitrary point in the non-escaping set, then uh, there's a dichotomy. So either the fiber of this point Z is trivial, and this is possibility T, or uh, it, it belongs to some renormalization part. Uh, in, uh, more, more formally, uh, the orbit uh, of Z maps into some field in Julia set of uh, some renormalization of F. And when I say renormalization, I really mean to a de Hubbard renormalization. Well, this result is, uh, in fact, uh, kind of under, under hood is, is actually not trivial, and it uses a lot of advances uh, that were done before us. Uh, so it uses this enhanced nest construction due to Kozlovsky, Shen, and Van Strien, and using the covering lemma due to Kahn and Lubitsch, who basically showed uh, with Avila and Shen how to use this covering lemma um, to prove rigidity for unicritical polynomials. So it's, it's a highly involved uh, result, uh, but it allows us to say a lot about every particular, uh, every point in the non-escaping set. Well, in particular, if we are non-renormalizable, then uh, all the fibers are trivial. So all the puzzle pieces shrink to points. Next result in the black box uh, for, uh, for box mapping is uh, the count of the ergodic components. So uh, let me remind you that an ergodic component is the positive measure set, that, which is invariant up to some measure zero set. And if the result that we were able to, to show is that if F is a non-renormalizable dynamically natural complex box mapping, then uh, every ergodic component uh, has a critical point that is a back density point of this component. In particular, the number of ergodic components is bounded by the number of critical points. Uh, well, uh, next result in the black box is about uh, the number of line fields, uh, how the uh, invariant line fields are structured for box mappings. And again, let me remind you that uh, invariant line field uh, supported on the field Julia set is the measurable assignment of uh, lines through each point, such that uh, if I transfer a line uh, as prescribed by the dynamics, I, I go to another line in this line field. Of course, this definition is non-trivial if the measure of my Julia set is positive, which well might be. And in fact, the non-renormalizable dynamically natural box mappings, they do have invariant line fields sometimes. But the result that we were able to show that this is a very, very particular situation when they do. In, uh, namely, if F carries an invariant line field supported on the Julia set, then uh, two conditions must be satisfied. First, there must be a puzzle piece J uh, with the smooth foliation such that um, the, the field Julia set sort of fills in measure this, this puzzle piece. This is this condition. And the, well, the, the foliation is a tangent to the invariant line field. And the second uh, property that uh, the F must satisfy, if I start mapping forward this, this puzzle piece J, uh, then the, each critical point that I intersect along the line must be strictly periodic. So this is the only way how to, uh, how to do that. And notice that in particular, if each puzzle piece contains escaping points, which for example happens if we construct Yukos puzzles, then uh, there are no line fields because I cannot fill uh, any particular puzzle piece in that way. But um, such creatures do exist and we call them lattice box mappings because they basically remind of, of uh, uh, rational lattice maps. Uh, and uh, well, in fact, if we start with the test, rational lattice box mapping, uh, they can be box renormalized to a, a lattice box mapping. So it's all consistent. And well, you can see it, uh, for instance, from a general result by uh, Felix and um, Juan on the so-called topological collect uh, and uh, their construction for nice couples. 
but you can also do it by hand. And this is a picture that uh, should convince you that this, this is doable. So what is this picture about? Uh, kind of on the bottom, you see a uh, construction uh, which starts with the, with the Serpinski carpet. Uh, and uh, I, I draw in here like two steps in the, the Serpinski carpet. Um, and then each square sort of maps up finely over, over the, the top square. And then I can filter it through uh, some Riemann map and then uh, some uh, Z square maps to, to acquire some critical points. And well, in fact, I result in such a box mapping. Um, so you can see here the box mapping with the, with the range having two components, V and V prime. Uh, well, the domain having infinitely many components, well, they're based on the Stupinsky carpet construction, but since I've shown you only two steps, here's only well, like, uh, uh, five components, but you can imagine here, they will be much more and they will uh, kind of dial uh, V prime. So all the red components that are, they are mapped one-to-one -one over V and uh, this blue component here is mapped one-to-one uh, uh, -one to V prime and this component a uh, big one maps two to one to uh, V prime. So this is a perfectly, uh, this is a, a box mapping and um, it has a critical point, which is actually fixed, uh, well, prefixed, right? So it maps to here and then it's fixed. Uh, so this is an example of latest box mapping. But again, this is, the, this is a dynamically natural box mapping. Uh, and this is sort of a very, basically the only way how you can imagine uh, having line fields. Okay, so, and then the final result uh, in, in our toolbox uh, is about uh, quasi-conformal rigidity for, for box mappings. And uh, what uh, we can show that if we have uh, a pair uh, F and uh, F tilde of uh, non-renormalizable dynamically natural box mappings, and we assume that they are combinatorially equivalent, um, which means that well, in our definition of combinatorial equivalence require that there should be a homeomorphism uh, from the range to the range, uh, capital H, uh, which is uh, equivalent on the boundary of, of uh, curly U. And uh, it provides a combinatorial equivalence between F and F tilde. Well, if that is satisfied, so if we're combinatorial equivalent, then we uh, can conclude that F and F tilde are was it can formally conjugate. And this conjugation in fact is extension from, uh, from H. It is actually interesting to, to show you this picture in, in relation to what Igers was uh, telling us uh, in the previous lecture. Uh, this is a picture that is supposed to illustrate what is the combinatorial equivalence for box mappings and how you can define it. So you can, well, naively you can start by saying, well, we have a sequence of puzzle pieces and we can assume that somehow the, um, well, the degrees of critical points are the same and puzzle pieces are sort of nested in, in the right way. Um, but this is not enough. And I think this is not enough exactly for the reasons that Igor was alluding to, because sort of uh, you have to remember that you are, uh, you, you have to remember some homotopy information uh, without which you cannot sort of uh, conclude with this naive definition of combinatorial equivalence. And this homotopy information basically says that uh, I can start with kind of drawing some curves. So I start with some, um, let's, let's consider an example. So we have a box mapping, um, which has a range uh, one disk uh, and uh, the domain two disks, one is mapped one to one and the other is mapped two to one. And I pick a point on the boundary um, and uh, this point has, well, three pre-images, two uh, in this component and one is here. And I can construct some sequence of curves, two, uh, well, three curves connecting uh, corresponding pre-images. And this is kind of the way how I can encode how the components nest within each other, plus some homotopy information. Because I can now lift this set of curves and uh, I require by my combinatorial equivalence definition is that when I drew this picture for my map F, and if I transfer this map, this, this picture via my uh, H, uh, my, my homeomorphism uh, H, I'll get up to a homotopy uh, 
the same situation for F tilde. So basically, that means that kind of the lifting procedure with respect to this curve should be the same for um, maps F and F tilde. Okay, and this is, uh, well, this is the result uh, that, uh, th this is the definition that allows you to conclude that we have uh, two uh, quasi-conformally conjugate uh, maps. And again, this result is not trivial. Uh, so the proof uses all the powerful machinery that were developed before us, uh, in particular, QC criterion uh, by uh, Kozlovsky, Shen, and Van Strien, and, and the covering lemma by uh, Jeremy and, and Misha. So this is basically it for, for the black box. And uh, I think I have 10 minutes to, uh, to show you success stories. Um, well, this is the strategy how to, how to use the black box. So I start with some globally defined dynamical system. I uh, first prove that this is box normalizable and uh, it uh, contains, well, sort of this, this renormalization captures the most interesting part of the dynamics. Then I prove that this, this box normalization is dynamically natural. Well, and then I can use the existing result for dynamically natural box mappings and embed them back to my starting dynamical system. Well, this strategy was successful in a number of cases. And now I can return to my first slide. Uh, I hope now it's, at least it's not immoral. It might be incomprehensible still, uh, but uh, I can, I can uh, show you uh, it is in some details now. So some of these results were not proven using box, map, box mapping techniques, but they can be reproved using that. For example, this result, uh, well, uh, about rational map with uh, one uh, totally invariant instantly connected to two component, you can prove, uh, uh, well, Bonner-Hubbard conjecture, absence of invariant line fields, ergodicity properties. Uh, and this is essentially the box mapping, uh, which was this yellow example somewhere at the beginning of the lecture. Then uh, there's a whole story about non-normalizable polynomials. And of course, this is uh, without uh, neutral periodic points. And this is a whole uh, story of, of uh, difficult results that we actually used. But of course, well, uh, you can reprove, uh, which is not very interesting. And uh, of course, for polynomials, you use uh, the classical construction of Yukos when you take uh, rays and equipotentials and you uh, obtain this nice neighborhood of your Julia set, uh, which, uh, which styles uh, this neighborhood finer and finer, uh, and uh, use these puzzles to construct box mapping, again, using this first return idea. Yeah. So in the case of uh, Yoko's puzzles, uh, it's possible that uh, some deeper component components share a boundary, but not coincide with uh, larger components, right? right? Uh, uh, yeah, this is this is true. Uh, for that, you can you can you can fix it depending on your your cost puzzle construction. You can use this thickening techniques uh, to uh, well. Usually, the landing uh, points, the landing uh, the, the points where these uh, boundary intersect the Julia set are repelling periodic points or the mm -hmm. crimages. So you can start with some linearizing neighborhoods, small one, and um, you can take not exactly this this angle of rays, but Kind of smart, slightly, you know, plus minus epsilon angles, and that will allow you kind of unglue these two puzzle pieces. Well, in this in this uh, setup, I see. So, uh, uh, in short, uh, this does not uh, immediately satisfy the uh, uh, box mapping, but uh, no. after some small work, you can make it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So uh, that goes into the uh, item number one. You have to show that something is box normalized. Yeah. Oh, well, there is some work. I'm not saying that this is kind of completely obvious. Well, perhaps the only result which is sort of completely, sort of obvious and immediate is the first one. This is where you, you use this equipotential. Um, then for, uh, there's a nice result of uh, Pascal Roche uh, and uh, John Chanin, I guess, uh, who showed that the boundaries of uh, uh, bounded uh, for two components of polynomials, except for Ziegel disks, uh, they are locally connected. And uh, you can also use uh, box mapping techniques. How do you construct 
puzzles, well, you use internal rays for this component and external rays, and then you cut them with the Q potentials, and then you provide the styling of the boundary. And you can use again the techniques uh, to prove that the boundaries are locally connected in arbitrary degree of polynomials. We can add uh, neutral dynamics, uh, provided that we can control uh, combinatorics. And there's a nice uh, recent result by um, John Gu Kyan, uh, who proved that uh, the fibers along the boundary of a Ziegle disk of bounded type rotation number um, are trivial. And for that, he constructed his puzzle partition using so-called bubble rays, uh, which are essentially constructed by from, from the Ziegle disk by taking it, its free images and adding some uh, external rays and again cropping with the, with the equipotential. potential. Uh, so you can analyze the situation. And uh, once this puzzle construction is available, you can hope to run this, this procedure uh, by box renormalizing. And this is what we are currently doing. So there's a work in progress with John Hook. Um, uh, we want to establish the following result, and I think we have it, that uh, if F is a non-renormalizable polynomial of degree uh, at least two with a Ziegle disk of bounded type rotation number, then, well, the whole Julia set is trivial uh, points in the Julia set of trivial fibers, not only at the boundary of Ziegle disk. And again, well, critical points can do whatever they want to do. Um, we can also, we, we working on the result that uh, basically shows QC rigidity for, for this class of polynomials, again, by importing something from the black box. Okay, and then of course, uh, well, everything that was said previously was either using equipotentials or was using uh, some rays. And for rational maps, unfortunately, this is not available. And uh, there are a couple of classes of rational maps where um, we have results. One is about McMullen maps. Uh, as you can see here on the slide, this is this family z to the n plus lambda over z to the n. And um, this is a one complex dimensional family of maps. And uh, uh, we, Juan and Yin, proved that the boundary of uh, basin of infinity, which is a uh, yeah, boundary of the basin of infinity is locally connected. Um, the point is that this map has a very nice symmetries, which allows you to construct sort of cutting rays, which intersect the Julia set in infinitely many points. And this is a completely different construction uh, to, to the classical external, uh, external rays, but it heavily uses the symmetries of this map. So this is the uh, family uh, with one uh, complex dimension, and perhaps the largest family of rational maps for which we know the result is this Newton maps of polynomials. And uh, let me briefly just go through that because this is something that's uh, sort of there to my heart. Uh, and uh, so what is the Newton map of a polynomial? Well, this is the rational map of this form where P is a polynomial and uh, uh, yeah, we construct this map and it's uh, used for finding roots of this polynomial P. Uh, and this, this map has a very nice structure, which you can see here on the picture. So this is the, well, Riemann sphere color, colored by points, which attracts to uh, the roots of corresponding polynomial is of degree seven. And you can see that this, this uh, basin, so uh, they, they, they touch very nicely somewhere at infinity. Uh, and infinity is a repelling um, fixed point is the only fixed point except for the roots. And this particular structure of a dynamical plane allows us, well, basically gives us everything that we need to understand this big family of dynamical systems. Because what we, well, we're able to prove that in each basin we can pick some sort of internal rays, but now it's rational map, this, this internal rays, uh, well, they, they touch, at, at infinity, but then if you start taking primages, they can uh, scatter all, all around the, the sphere. So uh, we can define um, kind of preliminary graph, take it full back. The problem is that uh, when we start taking primages of, of some rays, they can start being disconnected from what we want to be connected. So because there are some points which are false that maps over to infinity. And that has to be dealt with uh, Unfortunately, I don't have time to go into details, but 
by joint uh, result with Jena Mikulic and Johannes Rupert and Dirk Schleicher, we were able to construct Newton puzzle pieces and uh, by analyzing a bit further uh, jointly with Russell Lodge and uh, Mike Savinsky, we were able to show that Newton maps are box renormalizable. And once we have that, remember this is step number one in, in this uh, strategy. Uh, as you can see, it's, it's non-trivial, but once we have that, we can start importing. And let me just show you what, what is the result that we can obtain by importing from the black box. For arbitrary polynomial Newton map, N sub P, we can prove this trichotomy of uh, point, what, what happened uh, to points uh, on the sphere. So the trivial thing that can happen is that uh, this point Z belongs to the basin of attraction of some root, and hence it's, well, it's doomed to, to be attracted to that root. The second, well, and the other two alternatives you've seen already. So this is a triviality of fibers or a normalizable part of the dynamics. So essentially we, we show that modulo is, is our item. We don't know what's going on in this Julia set, uh, the embedded Julia set. We know exactly, uh, well, everything for other points. And uh, well, there was some previous work on cubic Newton maps, which, which proved the results in, in this direction by Stanley, Head, uh, and Roche. And uh, this result for um, uh, non normalizable. Um, so it, in, there was an independent work by Wan Yin and Zhen who proved uh, local connectivity of the basins of root, uh, but they were not using uh, box mappings. Um, and uh, well, as you can imagine, I can also embed this QC rigidity result uh, into Newton dynamical system. And uh, the result that we obtain is the following theorem, which basically says that, well, provided that we have two uh, combinatorially equivalent Newton maps, uh, they are, they are quasi-conformally conjugate if they are either both non-renormalizable or if the renormalization parts, they are embedded into this, well, Newton dynamical plane in combinatorially the same way. I don't have time to define it precisely, but um, I think it's at least uh, morally should be clear. So either we don't have this R options at all, and hence we can uh, conclude uh, QC rigidity, or we have to say something about renormalizable bits. And well, to conclude, uh, this uh, quasi conformal conjugacy, we should say that these bits are embedded in the same way. And uh, the, the independent work was done by uh, Pascal, John Shen, uh, Yin, and Ren, uh, who proved uh, the same thing for non normalizable Newton maps. And I think I should stop here because my time, time is up, and I uh, thank you for your attention. Uh, okay, so we also have rigidity of schedule today. So just maybe two uh, fast uh, questions. Oh, oh, okay, probably a silly question, um, but um, you, in your theorem, you about the or your statement about the Ziegel disk um, case and the triviality of fibers. You said you have triviality of fibers, and in particular, the GS that is locally connected. Um, but yeah. you're talking about polynomials, right? So the two things should be equivalent, or is there some some subtlety that I'm missing? Uh, no. Okay. <laughs> I'll, I'll ask some more questions, but uh, offline. Okay. <laughs> Other questions? Super rigid. Yeah. Uh, okay. Okay. Then it's good. Then let's uh, thank Costa again. And uh, we will have a uh, 10 minutes coffee break till uh, 11 uh, 20. But before that, please, please listen yes, to the announcement. A few announcements about the trip.